Well, you're about to discover, maybe for the first time in your life, that wealth is not money, and money's not wealth. Uh, real estate's not wealth either. Uh, neither is gold or silver. What is wealth? I believe that wealth is one thing. Wealth is the value that you create for someone other than you. That's what wealth is. Wealth is the value that you create for someone other than you. And so the more we develop our ability to create value for other people, the more wealthy we are. And, and the reason I say money's not wealth, think about, think about it like this. If you were stuck on a desert island and you had hundreds of millions of dollars in cash, what would it be worth? Nothing. Right? If you're stranded there, nobody knows you're there, nobody can find you, all that money doesn't do you any good. Um, if you're there with another person, and they have food, and you have water, and they have no water, and you, you have no food, then your water becomes your wealth because you can trade them some of your water for some of your food. Are y'all tracking? And, and so, so everything that we desire, everything that we desire, we get by giving somebody else something they desire. The more value we create for other people, the more wealth we have. It's just that simple. Now, money is one of the stores of value. That's what money is. Money is a store of value, and it's also a way to transfer value. It's also a way to represent value that you've already created, right? So, so if, you think about, if you think about money as, a, as like a certification, right, like it's a certificate that proves that you've created value for someone other than yourself. Right, and so like if you go to if you go to Eddie V's um, and you're a nice person, right, and you say, well, I would like for y'all to serve me some food, they are going to say, okay, we'll serve you some food, but at the end they expect you to produce proof that you've served somebody other than you, and that proof shows up in the way of money, right? Because that's all money does. Money shows people that you deserve to have somebody create value for you because you can prove you created value for someone else, right? And here's what's really cool. All of us are good at different things. So we all have different value that we, that we can create for other people. And if we keep the value that we create to ourselves, it doesn't really do us that much good. But if we spread the value, the, the, the value that we create for other people, um, if we spread that around, then it becomes more valuable. Now, here's what's really interesting. I can't create value for someone until I know what's valuable to that someone. So, so wealth creation has like a lot to do with discovery, like discovering what other people value. And if I'm going to know what other people value, then I got to know where, where, like, where do those values come from? Like, where do values come from? Where, do, like, I, there are things you value that I don't value. There are things I value that you don't value right? And there's things that we both value, but you might value more than me or I might value more than you. Huh. So where do our, where do our values come from? Okay. I believe the first place that values come from is past, perceived, I'm just going to do P-E-R-C, perceived voids create present pursued values. Are y'all tracking? Past perceived voids create present pursued values. What does that mean? That means if I feel like something was missing in the past, I will work in the present to fill the void that I had in the past, right? So, so that's why if, if people grow up in a place um, where they're, they're in like dire hunger conditions or feast or famine, they value food like at a very high level, right? Um, that's why people who, so for me, like, I like cars. I like them. I like cars. I, I grew up working on cars, right? Um, but I grew up in a family where when I was growing up, my parents never bought a new car ever. They had seven boys. Here's what boys do. They eat you out of house and home, right? They just, boys can just, it's like they're a bottomless food pit, right? 
And I, I can remember, like, if I was, if I was a, in elementary school, if I was going to eat a sandwich, I wouldn't eat a sandwich. I'd eat two, three, or four sandwiches, right? So, so but I like cars. And so we grew up with buying $50 cars, $100 cars, and then working on them and driving them until they broke down. Then we'd go buy another $50 car, $100 car, and we had no car payments, right? Um, so, so I like cars. I used to see people with nice cars. I'm like, why do they have nice cars? We don't have nice cars, right? So I, that's a past perceived void in my life, right? So it became a present pursued value. Some people like, why do you have all these expensive cars? Well, expensive is a relative term anyway. I don't even, like, that's really relative. Like, it depends on, like, what is expensive to you, right? So, but the reason I, like, have a collection of, I say a collection, I've got some very nice cars is because I like cars, because that was, for me, a past perceived void. Um, um, I work out. Why do I work out? Um, because in the past, I've been out of shape. And in the past, my, my body hurt. The more out of shape I was, the more my body hurt. So that's a past perceived void that created a present pursued value. Are y'all tracking? And, and so, so a lot of times, we don't even know where these, these like, we don't even know where these things that we value came from, right? Um, I value entrepreneurship, why? Because in the past I used to have jobs and they always came with a boss. And I don't know, the, the word boss means like they're gonna be bossing me around. That's what, like they're gonna tell me, like can I go, no. And I can't even finish the question, right? Can I have, no. And I, I don't like, to have to ask for permission. I don't like permission. In fact, the best way to get me to do something is to tell me I can't do it. I'm that dude, okay? I, don't, I know none of you entrepreneurs are that way, right? So <laughs> you started business because you love people telling you what to do. Okay, uh, judgment-free zone. And, and, so, and so, so, so I like autonomy. I, my parents, great parents, they weren't perfect parents by any stretch of imagination, which is why I did not become a perfect parent. Okay, so, but, but they were great parents for me and my brothers, right? And they were very authoritarian. Like, like, it didn't matter if I was seven or 17, why the answer was always gonna be the same, because I said so, right? So, so I liked autonomy. So when I did, wasn't at home, I didn't have to, I didn't like, I didn't like teachers telling me what to do at school. I didn't like my parents telling me what to do at home. See, my, and then I got a job and the boss wanted to tell me, and everybody wanted to tell me what to do. And I, I, I know it's my own little weirdness going on in my mind palace, but like you got yours, I got mine, and I don't like people telling me what to do. So I live, I want to live as autonomous. Now, I want God to tell me what to do, but I don't like humans bossing me around. Okay, because their motive is suspect. God's motive is not suspect, right? <laughs> right? Um, and so, so and, and that's why I don't, like, I don't like it when people on my team call me, oh, this is my boss. I'm not your boss. I don't even like the word boss. I don't have an outfit that matches a boss. You don't have an outfit that matches a boss. So unless we're talking about business optimization success secrets from boss moves, then again, that's a different story. But not bossing people around. Anyway, so, so y'all get it. Past perceived voids create present pursued values. But also, the second place values come from, the second place values come from is present, present, pursued, I, didn't, I don't think I spelled that right, pursued victories create present um, pursued values. So, so present pursued victories, the things I'm working towards winning right now will cause me to value that thing. And so I've got to value, I want to win. So what, because I want to win, okay, for instance, I'm going to put my son-in-law on blast. So my son-in-law, I mean, we're really, really close until we get on the golf course and then we try to beat each other's brains out. It's great. Okay, <laughs> so, so he wants to beat me really, really bad. I want to beat him really, really bad. And for a while, I just beat him all the time. And then, like, I lost my mojo, and then he beat me all the time. And he was sending his mom text messages like, there's a new sheriff in town. And then his mom would call me, and I'm like, is this really happening? Okay, cool. So, so I started working on my short game again. And so now it's like the last three rounds, the last three tournaments we've had, we play three round tournaments and we have this trophy. And every time you win three rounds, you get to put your name on the trophy. 
No, it's not on the news, it's not on ESPN, nobody knows but us, but we relish this victory so much, right? And so, and so what we do because we both want to win is we both spend time working on our game because present pursued victories create present values. So the things that we felt like were missing in the past, that, that creates value for us. The things that we're working on winning in the present, and then the last one, is future, future pursued, I think I spelled that right, I don't know. It's pursued visions create present perceived values. So what does that mean? That means I can see an outcome down the road that is worth sacrificing right now for so I'll sacrifice the short term on the altar of the long term. I'll sacrifice like my pleasure right now because I've got this vision down the road. And I'll, I'll take some time off of playing golf. And I'll take some time off of practicing my guitar. I'll take some time off from something I want to do for me. Like, okay, give you, give you a for instance. I am a foodie. If I wanted to... I could easily weigh four, five, six hundred pounds. It would be easy. Like, I like food. You say, what kind of food? Almost all kinds. I mean, I don't like pork, and I don't like shrimp, and I don't like yucky stuff. It's disgusting. Um, and I, but, but, like, but I like to eat. And the better it is, the more of it I like to eat. I'm just keeping it real. Like, brother man can throw it down. I can fling it down. Hear me when I tell you. I mean, where are my foodies? Where are my foodies? Okay. But because I have this future vision right? Like, I've got this future vision. I've got a granddaughter. She's three. One of the highlights of my life, my entire existence on this planet as a human, was when I got to dance with my daughter at her wedding. That was a highlight for me, okay? So, one of my future visions that I have is to dance with my three-year, three, with my granddaughter, not at her wedding. My three-year-old granddaughter. She's not going to get married at three. That's not what I mean. Like my granddaughter, who is three, when she becomes an adult, one of my objective is to one of my objectives is to dance with her at her wedding. Well, let's say she gets married when she's 21, like my daughter did. Okay, that gives. Okay, she'll be four in July, so that gives me 17 more years. Well, in 17 years, I'll be. Oh snap. I'll be 79, right? You know what that tells me? That tells me as much as I love food, and I do love it, I don't like it, y'all. Hear me when I tell you. If I'm going to eat something, I want it to taste. I don't even want to waste any time eating food that don't taste good. Okay, y'all tracking. It's like I'm the guy who when I make spaghetti, I season the water, I boil my noodles in. I'm that dude. Okay, how many of y'all tracking? Okay, now y'all know who y'all dealing with. Okay, so... So, <laughs> just keeping it real. Okay, so, but because I want to dance with my granddaughter at her wedding when she gets married, I don't eat food until 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And I drink water in the morning, and I have a window to eat between 1 p.m. and 9 p.m. It opens at 1 with a protein shake, then I'll eat some snacks, in between, like some carrot chips or some celery or something good with some different, whatever dip I decide. I'll mix some honey mustard and some ranch, and I know that's not healthy. I don't really care. This is my, this is my vision, y'all. You do, do you. I'm going to do me. Okay, I know that's not the healthiest thing in the world, but it's what I do right now. So if y'all want me to do better, pray for me. Okay, so. And, and then I'll eat dinner. So that's... That's, but I'm going to make sure my protein shake is really, really good, and I'm going to make sure my snacks are really, really good, and I'm going to make sure when I eat dinner, oh, look at him, look at him, it's really, really good. Okay, so what am I telling you? I'm telling you what I, I'm willing, my value comes from something that I desire that's way in the future, that's willing, that I'm willing to sacrifice right now on, right? It's too many people, they don't understand that today is yesterday's tomorrow, and they act as if the things, that the actions they take today have no consequences in the future, right? And so the definition of sacrifice is to let go of something of a lower nature so you can take a hold of something of a higher nature. 
And the best way for us to live our lives, it's like it's been proven. It doesn't matter whether it's in finances, whether it's in health, whether it's in relationships. It doesn't matter what arena we're talking about. Sacrificing the short term on the altar of the long term always ends better than sacrificing the long term on the altar of the short term. It always does. It's just like a principle of life. Okay, so, so now I know when I'm looking at my particular marketplace in whatever particular niche I'm looking at, then I know what I have to do if I want to create wealth is I have to figure out how to help somebody fill their past perceived voids or how to win their present pursued victories or how to fulfill their future pursued visions. How many of y'all check, how many of y'all check it, track it? Okay, so, so now when I'm looking at somebody, I know what kind of value, how to discover what you value. Because you're going to value one of those three things. Whatever you're working on in your life is probably going to fit into one of those three categories. Now, wealth is the result of value creation. The better your ability to create value for someone other than yourself, the wealthier you are. And sometimes that'll show up as money. Sometimes it'll show up as real estate. Sometimes it'll show up as like hard assets like gold and silver. But, or it'll show up as digital assets like Bitcoin and Ethereum. But at the end of the day, whatever you pay for, you pay for with money that you earned by creating value for someone other than yourself. So the very act of entrepreneurship, by its very nature, has to be self-sacrificing if you're going to win as an entrepreneur. How many of y'all got it? Wait, wave at me. Say, I got it. Wave at me. Okay, good. Cool. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at what God set up in Genesis chapter 1. And I call it the four levels of value. So because here's what y'all, like, here's one of the things I think we don't understand sometimes. All value is not created equally, right? What does that mean? All value is not created equally. So I can say, well, but I created this value. Yeah, but the problem is, Either you valued it or maybe one other person valued it. You wonder why, like if you're not doing well financially, I'm going to tell you why. Because the pool of people that you've decided to create value for is very small. Or the thing that you, the value that you've created for them, they value it at a very low level. Like it's not like a big deal, right? Um, I'm going to pay more for a car than I am for a pair of shoes. Why? That's a bigger value. Why? It can take me farther take me farther faster than a pair of shoes, right? Um, so uh, to me, so watch this. So like even if I go to eat at Ocean Prime or I go to eat at Eddie V's and it costs $500 for dinner for like seven people or whatever, I value that more than I value the money, number one, but I also value it because it gives me the time that I want to spend or invest into the people that I care about the most. And I don't have to, like, I don't have to make the food. My wife doesn't have to make the food. My daughter doesn't have to make the food. My son, my son-in-law, we can just sit down. We can go to dinner. We can pay somebody. They make all the stuff. Like, we don't have to go in the kitchen and do anything. We don't even have to open the refrigerator. It's amazing. They just keep bringing it to you. And then you don't have to clean off the table. I mean, if you don't want to, you don't even have to put your own pepper on your food. They'll put the pepper on for you. This is amazing. And then, uh, when you get done, you don't have to clean the table off. You don't have to wash any dishes. You just leave. What? Sign me up right now. How many of y'all tracking? Like, so, so, so we have to get to the place in our lives where we realize that all value is not created equally, right? So while I'm giving you things that are not created equally, um, let me give you something that is created equally. Because all value is not created equally, all no's are created equally, but all yeses are not. What do I mean all no's are created equally? If you do a presentation to a potential client who does not have the wherewithal to buy your offer, and they say no, it feels the exact same as if you do a presentation to somebody who does have the wherewithal to buy your offer, and they say no. A no is 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 a no. Does that make sense? Okay. But if you talk to somebody who does not have the ability to take advantage of your offer, and you make an offer to that person, and they say yes, 
That's very different than when you talk to a person who has the desire to take advantage of your offer, and they say yes. They have the ability. One has the ability. One doesn't have the ability. Those are two very different yeses. All no's are created equally. All yeses are not. Why would you invest time talking to people who have neither the desire nor the willingness to buy your offer? That's why I don't do high-pressure sales. I'm just not interested in it. I don't, I, don't, I'm not, I don't need your money. I don't want your money. And if I got to drag you in, I'm going to have to drag you around. Like, I'm, like, we would all do better if we would just realize there are already thousands, potentially tens of thousands, potentially hundreds of thousands of people, maybe even millions of people in the world who would love the, to buy, to purchase the value that we create if they only knew we existed. And if that were really the case, then it, I would be better off to spend my time to make myself findable than I am trying to find somebody to sell something to. Is what I'm saying making sense? Okay, so all values not created equally. And in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, God gave us the four levels of value. The lowest level of value is implementation. Implementation, oh, by the way, let me say this. Wealth, wealth is, it's like the value we create for other people, but here's what you have to understand about wealth. Wealth is a spiritual result. What do I mean wealth is a spiritual result? Well, let me ask you a question. Is it more spiritual for you to think about you or for you to think about someone else? Which one? Someone else. It's more spiritual for you to think about solving the problems of someone other than you. Okay? So wealth is a spiritual result. By the way, wealth is also a spiritual result because uh, creativity is spiritual. Right? And so if you're going to create value for somebody, that's also spiritual. So watch this. So the lowest level of value is implementation. What do I mean? This is like if you're on this level of, if you're on this level of value, if you're creating value for other people at the implementation level, you have limited. Who's limited? Everybody tap yourself on the chest and say, I have. You've limited your ability to earn. Why? Because you're only going to make somewhere between minimum wage and about 80000 a year. Well... That sounds kind of painful. Why? Because you're using muscles, which are a physical resource, over time, which is a limited resource. So you're, you're literally using a physical resource over a limited resource to produce an unlimited spiritual result. No wonder you're stuck. This is why I tell people... Now, if you, like if you just love like mowing grass and you want to start a lawn care company, that's fine. You just love pressure washing, you want to start a pressure washing business, that's fine. You can make money and create a level of wealth, a level of wealth, but a limited level of wealth with a pressure washing business. You can. Or a landscape business or a janitorial service. But here's the problem. You're anchoring your income generation to time and physical labor. That is always going to pay you at the lowest possible level. Why? Because muscles are a physical resource. Time is a limited resource. Wealth is an unlimited spiritual result. Okay, what's the next level? The next level is unification. Unification on this level, you're going to make somewhere between 40,000 a year and maybe if you're like at a Fortune 500, Fortune 100 company, you might make, oops, you might make $250,000 a year. Well, that, how many of y'all know 40000 to 250000 is better than minimum wage to 80000 right? That's a, better, that's a better window. But, I mean, do you really, and maybe you do, but do you really want a whole year to go by and you only make $250,000? I mean, that's a question we have to answer for ourselves. And, and for some people, the answer is like, man, if I had oh, a year went by, I made $250,000, that's more than $20,000 a month. Sign me up right now. Okay, great. Sign you up right now, but probably not sign you up forever, right? Can I get a witness, right? Like, it's not, it's not a bad place to start, but it's not where we want to land, okay? What, what is this? This unification on this level, the resource we use on this level is our management skills. Managing people is a higher spiritual activity than doing the thing yourself. Are y'all tracking? That's why when people get into management, they make more. This person over here, they're making tacos at Taco Bell. They're making minimum wage. This person might be a mechanic working at a Rolls Royce dealership or maybe, maybe, probably, maybe a Mercedes dealership or BMW dealership. This person right here is managing Taco Bell. This person right here is a middle manager at Lockheed Martin. 
But the reality is, if some company is paying you $250,000 a year, they want you to know they know they own you. Am I telling the truth? They want you to know. They don't just want you to know they own you. They want you to know they know it. <laughs> right? And so, so, like, if that's what you desire, that's fine. But maybe, maybe there's a way to have a level of freedom beyond that. And I believe that wealth begins to be created above this line. Wealth begins on the level of communication. Communication, communication, <laughs> communication, on the level of communication. Now, somebody said uh, the level, the quality of your life will be equal to the quality of your communication. Okay, so communication, uh, the, the resource you use on this level is your mouth. Now, there's a caveat. You have to have a mouth. <laughs> you have to be willing to learn to use it. To do what? Create messages that move the masses. It's amazing. It's amazing that this, all of this, is harder than this. But to become a person who's skilled at this is harder than just doing this. What, what do I mean? Some people will maintain a state of physical diligence so they don't have to develop a level of verbal diligence and verbal intelligence and verbal acuity, right? They, I, I, just, I don't want to have to learn how to talk, so I'm just going to go ahead and keep on working my fingers to the bone. Well, that's one way to do it, right? Okay. Well, um, so communication. On this level, low, low end. You should make at least $100,000 a year. If you can sell cars, you can make 100000 a year selling cars, selling insurance, right? Selling um, advertising, 100000 a year. But on the high end, you might make $100 million. Why? Because you're using your mouth to deliver value. Well, Myron, what do you mean 100000 Like, you know who these people are? These people are salespeople, right? They're also authors. They write books. Like, we got, to, like, we have, our books probably make us $400,000 a year. Just books. I wrote them once, just get paid for them every day. <laughs> what is it? It's a message communicated. It's like these words that came to my mind, and they actually came out of my mouth. Like, I communicated a message that makes me hundreds of, I communicated messages. One of, one of the books I wrote in 2006. This is 2023. That's 17 years. This book has been making me money for 17 years. We sold over 155, 160,000 copies of this one book. Now, who could write a book? Anybody could. Who will write a book? Almost no one. Okay, so... Or you might, or these people are, these people are coaches and teachers and actors and songwriters and, and playwrights, right? We, oh, let, let, please don't let me forget this one, and YouTubers. It's crazy town. YouTube? YouTube? Don't even get me started on YouTube, y'all. I might not be able to get off of it. Like, YouTube? You, like, I had no idea. I've been on YouTube since 2007. 2007. I didn't even know there was a thing called turning on monetization until 2022. How many years is that? 15. I think it's 15. Ain't that 15? 15 years. I was on YouTube for 15 years. I didn't know all I had to do was click a button. They start paying me. Click a button. Like, this is how long it takes to click a button. Click. Get paid. I mean, I, I wasn't creating new videos. I had like 40 videos on. We turned on monetization. Did no new videos. The first month. Didn't do any new videos. Hadn't done any new videos in like eight months. Turned on monetization. And we got paid $305. And Zach's like, we made $305 last month. And I said, for what? <laughs> <laughs> but 
Because somewhere along the line, I communicated a message somebody wanted to see, and Google or YouTube was able to sell an ad on that. We're talking about 100, 200, uh, uh, this is amazing. Last year, we looked at it, I looked at it yesterday. I, I didn't know this was going to happen, so I didn't do it for this reason. Are you, are you all trying? What I'm about to tell you, I did not do for the reason I'm about to tell you what happened, okay? So we started doing YouTube videos intentionally April 1st last year. I looked at it yesterday. In the last 12, 365 days, as of yesterday, we made $289,000 that YouTube paid us. I didn't know they were going to do that. No, 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 you don't understand. I had no idea they were going to do that. Like, that, that wasn't why I did it. I mean, it was a nice side benefit, right? I've never had a job where I made $280,000 in my life. Most I've ever made at a job is $30,000, ever. Ever, as a full-grown man with a family. And you two paid me $289,000 for turning on a camera and running my mouth. Where the camera? <laughs> turn, on, some, turn on the camera. I got something to say. <laughs> the highest level of value is imagination. It still blows my mind. This, the, the resource you use at this level is your mind and your money to make money to create value for other people. And what happens is at this level, on the low end, low end, you're gonna make a million dollars. On the high end, it could be billions. And I know that sounds crazy. There's one YouTuber, this dude has 150 million subscribers. He gets over 100 million views a month. 100 million views. If he only makes $2 a view, that's 200 million a month. Are y'all tracking? It's just the, the, whole, the whole world that we live in is kind of insanical. That's kind of the combination of insane and maniacal put together. <laughs> this, so we can, we can fight to stay down here, and, and people will do it too, because this, everything you do down here is hard. But I don't know if anything's harder than than this, than thinking. Thinking is the hardest work most people never do. In fact, I believe that most people will maintain a state of physical diligence so they can maintain a state of mental laziness. They will work hard at what's not working so they don't have to think about what would work. They will, most people, <laughs> most people will work hard at what's not working so they won't have to think about what would work. They will, they will be, maintain a state of physical diligence, like working their fingers to the bone, sweat, blood, tears, so they don't have to think about what would work. So they can maintain a state of mental laziness. Most people are so mentally lazy, lazy it's pathetic. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Myron, I don't know about what you've been reading. I did not see that in <laughs> chapter one. Okay, I'm going to read it to you. It's, it's kind of mind-blowing. So a couple things. A um, couple things. One is that um, Genesis chapter 1, I believe, if all God wanted us to know from Genesis chapter 1 that was that he created everything, Genesis chapter 1 could have been Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Then he starts going into all this detail. And the earth was without form and void and darkness upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. And there was light, and God saw the light, that it was good. Like, what is all that about? Well, the first thing God tells about God is not that he is love, even though he's love. It's not that he's holy, even though he's holy. The first thing that God tells about God is not that he's omniscient or omnipresent or omnipotent, even though he is all those things. The first thing God tells about God is that he's creative. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. What's the first thing God tells about us? The first thing he tells about us is that he created us in his image, which means he created us to create stuff, and he made us to make stuff. What does that mean? What that means is when God created everything, after he created everything, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning God created heaven and the earth. After he, like, he did it, then he went back and documented the process so when we got ready to create value for someone else, we'd have a pattern. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. That was his intention. And the earth was without form. That word was is not used to be, it's became, without form and void. So disruption always follows intention, right? 
and darkness upon the face of the deep. So when disruption comes, it comes in the form of devoidness, deformity, and darkness. Like things get broken. There's confusion. Darkness is a picture of confusion and, 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 and fear and anxiety. And then the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. So you have this intention, and then this disruption follows your intention. So now you've got to find a source of inspiration. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. God said, let there be light. That's illumination. You've got to learn something you didn't know so you can see something you couldn't see. Do you see what happens when we, un- like, when we see God's not just, he's not just, well, I just happened to do this. And I no, no, no. He's showing us what to do. And then he took time to see what he had created, and then he recognized that it was good. See, some of us, like, we'll go do all this really great stuff, and then we won't even take time to enjoy what we've created. You're not even being like God. Okay, y'all tracking. So it gets more better. So here, here it is, Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to show y'all where I got this from. Genesis chapter numero uno. Here we go. Here's what it says. When God created man, I'm going to just go down to that part. Here's what it says. Um, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that moveth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him, male and female created he them. So, and God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every, moving, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Okay, so here's the first thing we see. And God said... I, it's really interesting. So if you go back and read Genesis chapter 1, what you'll see is you'll see it says, and God said, like at the, Genesis 1, I think it's verse 3, and God said, let there be light. Maybe it's verse 4. And God said, let there be light, right? Okay. When God created creation, he said, let there be. Let there be light. Let there be a firmament that separates the waters from the waters. So when God created creation, there's three categories. There's creation, there's creatures, and there's creators. When God created creation, he said, let there be. When God created creatures, he said, let the earth bring forth and let the waters bring forth. Let the earth bring forth the cattle and the creeping things. Let the water bring forth um, the fish and the fowl. What is God doing? He's delegating some of the work that he did to something that he's already created. So we could call that delegation. We could call that automation. Right? Are y'all tracking? So that you're not doing everything. Okay. So y'all tracking. Okay. Now. But when he created man, he didn't say, let there be man. That shows us that man is not a higher form of animal. He didn't say, let the earth bring forth man. He didn't say, let the waters bring forth man. So we know that man is very, very different than creation, and he's very, very different than creatures. How do we know that? Because what God said when he created them was different. When he created creation, he said, let there be. When he created creatures, he said, let the waters bring forth, let the earth bring forth. When he created man, here's what he said, let us. Let us make man in our image. Oh, oh, I'm about, what's he saying? I'm about to do something different, y'all, than everything I've already done. I saved the best for last. It's about to be on, y'all. Okay, now, God said let us make man in our image. You know what that means? Before God could say let us make man in our image, the image had to exist first. That's why imagination is the highest level, because it represents God. It's the realm, God realm. God said, oh, there's the communication. By the way, could God have made man in his image without saying it? Yes, he could have. But he said it. Why? Because that's part of our creative power is to create messages that move us and messages that move others. Here's what the scripture says. A man shall eat good by the fruit of his mouth. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Thou shalt also declare a thing, and it shall be established where? Unto thee. I'm not talking about speaking things into existence. You can't do that. I can't do that. Only God could do that. That's a barah. The only person in Scripture who barrows is God. But what I can do is I can talk to myself like David did when he did what? Encouraged himself in the Lord. How do you encourage yourself in the Lord? Say the same thing to yourself that God said to you about you. When I speak God's word to me, guess what I'm doing? I am installing faith into a space where doubt used to exist. So I can take an action in faith that I could not take in doubt. How many of y'all track it? 
Why? How do I know that? Because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The word of God. So the best thing I can do for me is to say the same thing about me that God says about me. Because when I see myself like he sees me, now I can do what he says I can do and not what other people say I can't do. Are y'all tracking? And so, 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 and God's, so this, this is where I got the four levels of value, right? So when we're working at those highest levels, we're working that imagination realm. Then we start communicating, we're working that communication realm. But God didn't say, let me make man in my image. What did he say? Let us make man in our image. That's the unification part. Two are better than one in a threefold quarter is not quickly broken. Are y'all, like, this is, like, this is so powerful for, like, you want, you, like, the money is nothing more than proof that you've created the value. The wealth is the value that you create for someone other than yourself. And if you create enough value for enough other people, there's nothing in this world that you desire that you can't have. Now, and maybe that's not even what you want. Like, I, like, there's nothing in this world that I desire that I don't already have. So I'm, somebody commented on one of my videos, um, just, I just read yesterday, somebody commented on one of my videos, they said, but you can't take it with you. And? I can't take the lot I got with me. You can't take the little you got with you. We ain't taking none of it with us. That's first. But I said, I have neither the desire, I have neither the desire nor the inclination to take any of it with me. I, I'm, I'm not working to take it with me. I'm working so that I can c- keep contributing to the, to the charities and the ministries that I contribute to and so that I can leave the rest to my children, my children's children. I have no intention of taking it with me. I can send some ahead, and I can leave the rest here. I have no desire to take any with me. Myron, how much money do you want to make? As much as I can. How much wealth do you want to create? As much as I can. But wealth is not the money. Wealth is the value that I create for someone other than me. Okay, I got I to gotta finish. The last thing it says, Genesis chapter 2, because I didn't realize... Larry didn't tell me that I was getting ready to go over time, but that's okay. I'm gonna, I'm, it's okay. It's okay. Now I know who I'm dealing with. Okay. <laughs> Larry's my dude. Um, okay, so here's what it says. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul. I'm going to finish with this. God formed. What is that? That's the implementation. The last thing God did was made the physical part of man. Then what did he do? He... Breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The man that he made in his imagination with his communication, patterned after his unification, he breathed that man into the body that he formed. And the man became a living soul. That's why I call these the four levels of value. Now y'all know where I got it from in Genesis chapter 1. By the way, it's confirmed in Genesis chapter 11. The, the people in, in Babel were trying to build a tower whose top could reach heaven. Do you know how ridiculous that sounds in a day where they don't have hydraulics, they don't have helicopters, they don't have cranes? But here's what it says. The Lord God came down to see the tower, and the, sun, the city and the tower which the sons of men built it. And he said, this people is one, that's unification. They all have one language, that's communication, and one speech. Now this they begin to do, that's implementation. Now nothing will be restrained from them, which they've imagined to do. There are the four levels of value. If you apply these four levels, even working on something that's not good, it will still work. That's how powerful it is, because it's a principle, and principles are God's automation. So let's make sure we apply the four levels of value to something good and not to something evil. I hope that blesses you. Thank you for subscribing. By the way, next Friday, um, which is the 9th, I think, of June, I am going to be doing a giveaway for subscribers. So you want to subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you haven't already, you want to subscribe to the channel because we're going to be picking some subscribers. You want to subscribe publicly so people know, so we can pick from the people who subscribe. And we're going to pick somebody, and we're going to be doing a giveaway. I'm not going to tell you what the giveaway is right now, but I'll tell you on the Bible study here that's coming up in a few minutes. All right, bye for now.